Dateline, Tuesday, June 14th, Nevada primary election day. The scene, a typical suburban intersection in America's Sun Belt. Buckle up your seatbelts, everyone, because today we're going to look at what happens when strodes collide. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, or maybe more accurately today, suburbs and transportation. And you know, I just love making top 10 lists of terrible infrastructure. When I did my video on pedestrian overcrossings, which featured the intersection of Las Vegas Boulevard and Tropicana Avenue, I kind of wondered aloud whether this was the largest signalized intersection in the US or even the world based on the absolutely absurd number of approach lanes, 29 in all. Luckily, this is the internet, so it took like an hour tops for one of my trusty viewers to correct me. Nathaniel Santiago pointed out that SR7 and Forest Hill Avenue in West Palm Beach actually has more approach lanes. Well, trust but verify, right? So let's check it out. I actually count 31 approach lanes here, and that's not even including the, I don't know, bike lanes that are squeezed in between the through lanes and the right turn lanes. Can you even imagine trying to bike through this intersection? Anyway, this got me pretty excited about the possibility of doing like a 10 most offensively large intersections video. But to be honest, I wouldn't even know where to start with that. I mean, maybe they're all in Florida. So instead, what I'm gonna do today is take a deeper dive into a local example so that we can really understand the disaster that unfolds when two strodes intersect, the contortions traffic engineers have to go through to make it all quote unquote work, and how people who have to navigate it without a car are usually complete afterthoughts. So quick refresher on what a strode is. It's an arterial that attempts to fulfill both the commercial purposes of a street and the speed and throughput purposes of a limited access roadway. And in attempting to achieve both of those goals, it manages to make a hash out of the whole thing. So strodes are in and of themselves bad, but what I wanna focus on today is maybe the most offensive part of the whole thing which is what happens when two of them intersect. I referenced this in my Strodes video from a while back where I counted up the approach lanes on the northbound Decatur leg of its intersection with Charleston in West Las Vegas. But today I want to look at a more suburban location that really reflects the design decisions that characterize suburban transportation planning and policy in the US. And for that, I'm going with the intersection of St. Rose Parkway and Eastern Avenue in Henderson, Nevada. Let's take a quick tour of these two beauties so we can see what we're getting into. In traffic engineering, when you do an intersection study, you look at a pretty wide influence area, maybe a quarter mile in each direction, looking at upstream and downstream signals, cross streets, driveway accesses, land uses, anything that might affect traffic flow through the intersection. So let's take a tour around the influence area and look at some typical strode land uses. Big box stores set like a country mile back from the street with acres of surface parking, check. Drive-throughs, which are endemic to strodes. Drive-through banks, for sure. Drive-through coffee joints. But it's really the drive-through fast food places I mean, nothing says suburbia quite like sitting in your car for 20 minutes in line, waiting for like some chicken tenders and fries you're gonna eat off your lap while you have one hand or maybe just a knee on the steering wheel. The thing about this part of America, and you may not properly understand this if you live in another part of the world, I'm talking about drive-throughs that require their own coned off areas and specialized traffic logistics just to keep the queue from blocking adjacent travel lanes and drive aisles. It gets really hairy at a place like In-N-Out and heaven forbid you have a craving for a religiously sanctioned fried chicken sandwich because that requires a double lane drive-through. These places are built like, I don't know, New Jersey toll plazas. What else? Well, wing joints, including the best wings in town. No, not this place. I mean this one. Money laundering operations. I mean mattress stores. Gun shops. Glorified ham and egg shops. Shops that sell both beef and pizza. Purveyors of fine beverages. 
I compared the Strode to an ecosystem in my earlier video. Well, it's not just a metaphor. Even in a desert that's almost completely paved over, the habitat teems with wildlife. The larger point here is all these land uses in the intersections influence area are big trip generators. So it's not gonna be uncommon for someone to travel through this intersection multiple times on the same trip, which really just exacerbates all the problems. So let's take a look at intersection geometry. These are strodes. We know they're big streets. And if you look upstream in each direction to check the typical cross section, Eastern is three through lanes and St. Rose is four through lanes. These are really big footprints as it is, but look how they widen out as you approach the intersection. This kind of has a sick logic to it, if you think about it, because a signal basically cuts throughput in half or worse. So you kind of need something like double the approach lanes through the intersection to provide the same capacity as whatever the typical cross section is upstream and downstream. It's really perverse. After all, the intersection is where you actually need the most space for things like signal poles and cabinets, ADA ramps, pedestrian queuing. So there are a lot of competing needs you have to balance. Yet over and over again, the priority is to provide as many turn lanes as possible to increase the capacity of the intersection. In traffic engineering, there's actually a term for this, which is blowing out the intersection. The other thing you do as a traffic engineer to get the most capacity out of the intersection is optimize the signal timing. Usually this means very long cycle lengths, and in the middle of the day at this location, we're talking 180 seconds, three minutes long. The explanation for this is when you have a very large intersection, there's a significant amount of what we call lost time that's built into each phase. To explain this, let's talk about the signal cycle at this particular intersection. This is a six phase cycle. First phase is an eastbound through with a leading protected left turn, followed by an eastbound westbound through then a combined westbound through and lagging protected left. Then we go to a southbound through and leading left, a combined northbound southbound through, and finally a northbound through and lagging left. The cycle length varies a bit, but it runs at 180 seconds at busy times. These are typical phase lengths I observed, but they're gonna vary depending on how much demand is detected for each movement and whether there's a pedestrian call for one of the crosswalks which I'll talk more about later in the video. So let's get back to lost time. The actual equation for lost time is more complicated and includes things like how late drivers will still enter the intersection on a yellow, even though they shouldn't, and driver's reaction time to start up after a signal turns green. But a simple way to think about it is, it's the sum of the yellow time plus the all red time. If you don't know what all red is, there's a short period after each phase where you keep everything red to ensure all the movements are completed. Generally, the bigger the intersection is, the more yellow time and all red time you need to clear the intersection and prevent T-bone collisions. So for each phase at this intersection, I observed something like 4.5 seconds of yellow time and 2.5 seconds of all red. These will be smaller numbers at smaller intersections, but for monsters like this, that's something like seven seconds you lose out of the cycle for each phase. So what this means is to reduce the proportional impact lost time has on the entire cycle length, you wanna make the cycle as long as possible within reason. And a really big limiting factor is the longer the cycle length is, the more queue storage you need in your turn lanes. And look at how long these bad boys are. And worst of all is how this impacts people walking, biking, and rolling through the intersection, which I'm gonna to get to in just a bit. But first, the usual reminder to drop a like on the video if you enjoy detailed explorations of intersection ops, and really, who doesn't? Subscribe and hit the bell if you want content like this every week. Consider joining the Patreon, link in the description, if you wanna ensure that I don't have to advertise like weird crypto stuff on this channel just to stay financially solvent. And let's check the sub count. I did hit 50k subscribers this past week, so thanks to everybody who's been joining up. I had a lot of Stadia I could have gone with this week, but I really can't pass on Yankee Stadium. 
It isn't the original, but it's still iconic in its way. And even if there's just way too much parking, the train access is absolutely top notch. I'm not really a Yankee fan at all, but I am a Yankee Stadium fan. So let's talk about how this monster intersection accommodates or doesn't accommodate people who aren't driving. First of all, a couple key pieces of information I left out when I was setting the scene. Transit, Line 110 runs on Eastern and is one of RTC's busiest routes. And as always, with transit, riders have to cross the street at least once, either on their way to board the bus or after alighting from it. Also, St. Rose does not have sidewalks. Instead, it has a multi-use path, which is complete on the south side and actually pretty good for biking. And there's a less useful one on the north side. The result is you get a lot of people biking across the south leg of the intersection, in addition to all the other people who need to cross. So what I haven't talked about yet is these slip lanes with the pedestrian islands, which honestly, in the biz, we use the highly technical term pork chop. Really, it's as if the traffic engineers have done everything they can think of to make crossing this intersection as unpleasant as possible. First, you have to cross the slip lane, which you would think would be straightforward. Like, there shouldn't be confusion about who has the right of way here. After all, there's a crosswalk and a yield sign. But if you've crossed a suburban intersection like this at any point in your life, you know, in practice, about 75% of cars just completely disregard whether there's a pedestrian trying to cross. Then when you get to the island, it's noisy. There's debris all over the place that makes you wonder how safe you really are walking there. And here's something really fun. Huge skid marks on the island itself. Good times. So everything about this is designed for the convenience of people driving cars so they're minimally impeded when they're trying to turn right. The islands are uncomfortably small, so if you're in a group riding bikes, you have to crowd onto the island. Like, how does this work if you have kids with you? Also, if you show up at the wrong time, like in the middle of the eastbound phase, they're not gonna extend the green to give you a walk signal, so get ready to wait about three minutes. Three minutes is a lot of time to be waiting in a place like this. As for the pedestrian push button itself, how the timing for walk and don't walk indicators is calculated and how well people understand them, well, I covered that in my video on ped overcrossings, but this tweet basically sums up my feelings on the subject. The last uh, characteristic I want to mention before we leave here is the posted speeds on the streets. Eastern is posted at 45 miles per hour, which is depressingly typical for this kind of suburban arterial. St. Rose, though, is a state highway. Not that that excuses it, but it's signed at 55 miles per hour. Oh yeah, and apparently the striped shoulder is totally appropriate for people walking and biking. Traffic goes 60 plus here. It's not a limited access highway. It's a suburban arterial that has signalized intersections and driveway accesses on it. It's just complete madness. And I'm not gonna show it, but there's a roadside memorial at the southeast corner of the intersection where vigils are still held from time to time. You see, a couple months ago, a driver who was stopped at the signal on the westbound approach of St. Rose was struck from behind by another car. The first driver's fuel tank exploded and, well, there's a roadside memorial. So there's nothing about the design of these streets or the intersection where they converge that really convinces me human health and safety are a high priority. How a signalized intersection is designed and operates is really a statement of a city's values, or maybe even the values of wider U.S. suburban culture. If you have inhumanly large intersections with high speeds and three-minute cycle lengths, it's a very clear indication that your city values personal motorized vehicle throughput above really everything else. Okay, that's all the super uplifting content I have today. Thanks for watching and thanks as always to the patrons who keep this channel running like the well-oiled machine it is. I will, of course, be back with a new topic next week and I'll see you then.